Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Gwaltney. Good morning and welcome to In the Word. We are looking at uh, the birth of Christ narrative in Luke. And we began last week and we will continue with that theme uh, this morning. Uh, we be, uh, Lee, we begin uh, with our scripture at the verse where last week's lesson ended. Right. We had the Annunciation to Mary. Yes. And as part of that Annunciation, she learned that her probably older relative, maybe an well, aunt, maybe she, a cousin. In fact, it said that Elizabeth, in fact, Zachariah said she was beyond the age of bearing children. Right, right. So her older relative, uh, she learned as part of the Annunciation, is surprisingly enough pregnant. And uh, so Mary went directly to to be with her and perhaps to help her with her pregnancy or at least to celebrate it with her. Well, she had to leave Nazareth and travel south. Uh, well, probably did not go through Samaria. The usual route mm -hmm. for a Jew was to cross over uh, just south of the Sea of Galilee, cross to the east side and travel down the east side and then recross right. down around Jericho. Because um, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived in Judea, yes. uh, near, near Jerusalem somewhere, uh, where Zechariah, who was a priest, would be, have access, ready access to the temple. And he, he was actually involved at this, uh, had been mm -hmm. at least, mm -hmm. uh, in the temple. So his mm -hmm. dwelling must have been just in a village just outside of Jerusalem. Right, right. In the hill country, right. I think it's stated. So. so the story continues today. Well, most of Judea is hill country, isn't it? Most it's of It's pretty them. hilly, yeah. <laughs> so uh, our story does continue today with Mary's arrival uh, with Elizabeth. The interesting thing to me is I have a feeling that Mary went to celebrate uh, Elizabeth's good news that in her old age her barrenness had come to an end and yes. she was going to have a son. But as we're going to see in our scripture text today, uh, Elizabeth turned it around and instead yes. wanted yes. to celebrate Mary's pregnancy and uh, the one that would be born to her. I think at this, by this time, uh, Mary's pregnancy was known to her, that, that is to Mary, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's certainly going to be revealed to Elizabeth in, in, as they meet. Yeah. Now, I, you know, over the years, I've really been concerned about this girl on the road and I'm wondering, uh, did she take this journey, which was quite a journey, mm -hmm. uh, did she take this alone or was she traveling in company with others? Uh, we don't know the answer to this. But, no, uh, but people did, reg Jewish people did regularly travel between Galilee and Jerusalem for and, purposes of worship yes. and, and other, um, and business. So there would have been regular groups of people making that trip. And I think it's likely that she would have attached herself to a group of people relatives trust, or trust. friends that yeah. she knew, family friends that she could travel back and forth with. Yes, she makes, she makes one trip to Judea uh, at this point uh, during her first trimester. She may have been pretty sick right at this period of time which would have made this, uh, I mean, with nausea, yes. and which would have made this a difficult journey. And then, of course, she's going to take this same journey again at the time of the birth of Jesus. Yeah, just prior to the birth, When yeah. she's eight, seven or eight months pregnant. Eight, yeah. Uh, and it would have, again, have been a very difficult journey. Well, but the journey, I, I, we always feature the journey on the way to Bethlehem as being she is, she is on a donkey. There's no reference. No to reference that. to no. a donkey, but no. uh, anyway, but you know, I've got, I would have to change my crash at home <laughs> if if you eliminate the donkey. I yeah. mean, <laughs> and there also there's no reference to camels with the wise men either. 
So, oh my! <laughs> see, that really is going to mess up all of our nativity scenes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, That's it's right. it's terrible. Well, but last at any week, rate, she mm -hmm. she made this trip, and it was very obvious that it was a very important thing for her to do. Yeah. And in as it turns out, it's a very important thing from the standpoint of Elizabeth. Oh yeah. Now, yeah. Zechariah is not mentioned here except that it's the house of Zechariah, I no, think. No, but he's going to be featured more prominently he, he, uh, in, oh, the, yeah. in our next lesson. Yes, yeah. right. So last week we had what we call the Annunciation, meaning the, um, the announcement of God's intention through a divine messenger Gabriel. to use Mary as the, uh, the mother of Jesus, the Savior. And this week we have in our text a very famous portion, which we often refer to as the Magnificat, yes, which is Mary's celebration. Song, song of celebration. Song of celebration yeah. regarding the verse. So we'll be uh, looking today at what we call the Magnificat. Well, the title uh, that we have been given for today is the affirmation of the promise, the mm -hmm. promise being in the, the uh, Annunciation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we tried out some other words. Mm -hmm. um, Endorsement, validation, and I think we came up with the best one, probably the celebration. Yeah, I think uh, both Elizabeth and Mary in this passage we have today uh, celebrate what God is doing through Mary in bringing about a Savior. And so we'll see their celebration. Do you think it's then appropriate for us uh, in the Advent season, uh, focusing on Christmas Day itself, mm -hmm. uh, that we celebrate. Yeah, we do. We, we have funny ways of celebrating sometimes. Uh, we do, but, uh, but celebration is the appropriate uh, general mood, I think. For uh, what's your favorite it's... form of celebration? Wow, <laughs> my favorite form of I, celebration. I know what uh, happens. What? Uh, you know, uh, in in my family uh, yeah. celebration, we eat. Yeah, there you go. And we exchange presents. Right. And we smile a lot, <laughs> and we, uh, we're, you know, that that our, our form of celebration. That is good. Yeah, <laughs> eating's pretty important, isn't it? That <laughs> it is, is a good one. Well, let me All read right. the scripture, read and mm -hmm. we'll we'll uh, explain a few things in it, and then then we'll. Enjoy the Magnificat. Right. This is Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lift, has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. 
Well, well, that's a beautiful passage. Should we? Beautiful we can't passage. sing a box. We uh, won't. Magnificat. We won't sing it, uh, but we will celebrate it. <laughs> yes. And we will talk about it a little bit. Uh, it, it says that Mary hurried uh, down south to Judea, and uh, it makes me wonder a little bit what the hurry was. But I think she's just so overwhelmed with the news that the. Yeah. Divine messenger. Has well, this her. this is bordering on a miracle. Well, it is. And, How can Elizabeth and, be pregnant? Right. Well, and the same with her. How can she be pregnant? Yeah. Right. Uh, and so um, these are two miraculous births in a way. And uh, two, so, the, here are two lovely women who are so thrilled by what has happened and is going to happen that yeah they. Ladies yeah. do that, and I think they would they would understand each other better than anybody else could possibly understand them, because they yes. they've each in their own way experienced um, uh, an unexpected pregnancy. Yes, and uh, the joy of a child. Yeah, and and especially in in these two cases, an unexpected child. Yes, Mary was barely engaged, and here she is pregnant unexpectedly. And, and I'm sure Elizabeth had long ago given up any notion of, of bearing a child. You know, Psalm 113 is um, a psalm that is frequently recited and sung, uh, chanted uh, in various important occasions um, throughout the Jewish year, like at Passover, for example, just mm-hmm. for one example. And it, um, it, show, it, it, it really is a th- the theme that is really focused on here, and that is uh, God bringing down the mighty and raising up the weak. Mm. And one of the most weak individuals that that psalm refers to actually describes Elizabeth, mm. the woman who is barren, yeah. who is a, is a poor to be pitied person. Uh, less than a woman because she has not given birth to a child. Mm. That's the way they looked at it. Yes. Uh, she had, <laughs> and the psalm says that woman will be blessed and will be uh, like she has many, many children. Mm. And um, that's the way in which God intervenes. Yeah. And that's what exactly what God has intervened to bring about for Zechariah right. and Elizabeth. Last week we talked about how Luke focuses throughout his gospel, as well as in the birth stories, on the way in which God lifts up the lowly, and the way in which Jesus yes. reaches out to the to the marginalized. Well, the, what could be the, more lowly than an elderly lady giving birth to a becoming pregnant and giving birth to a child, or the poor a woman who is betrothed to a man? But then becomes pregnant before mysteriously. Marriage. Yeah. Uh, not only before marriage, but uh, by obviously somebody else or mm-hmm. uh, than yeah. than the uh, yeah. the intended husband. So, so a certain degree of social shame would have attached to both of these women. Right. And uh, so it's it's interesting to see how God is using these women in the midst of their shame. But when they get together, they're able to rejoice, rejoice together and reach above yeah. that, that shame because they know that God is doing something special with them. You know, one of the things that is important about, about the birth stories of Jesus is to be reminded that, that God uses women in powerful ways to accomplish his yes. will. Yes. And we, we sometimes uh, ignore that in our study of the Bible. But even in the Old Testament, God used women to accomplish some amazing things uh, Eve and the wife of Noah and uh, Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel during the time of the patriarchs. And Ruth. And Ruth, yes. The very, foreign woman. The foreign woman. It doesn't get low, more lowly than that. Right. Uh, a widowed foreign woman and impoverished, but she becomes the forebear of the great King David. The great David. grandmother of David. Yeah. And then uh, a number of uh, prophetic leaders were women as well. Deborah during the time of the judges yes. and, and Hulda during the time of the great King right. Josiah. So yes. uh, what we see here are two women who are very centrally located in the work of God to accomplish his purposes. 
Now, uh, let's focus on one statement in verse 41. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. at the point when the baby leaped in her womb. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden now she prophesies. Yeah. Yeah. In a loud voice, she proclaimed and then talks about Mary and talks and, and look at what she, how she refers to Jesus in verse 43, my Lord. Yes. Now that, that's a lofty title that's usually used of God, but here she's using it. Even used of uh, the emperor of Rome. Ah, true. <laughs> right. Very lofty title. So this phrase filled with the Holy Spirit is an interesting phrase. I think most of our viewers will recognize it best from the book of Acts, where it says that the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. But the important thing is not the phenomenon itself. The important thing is what that phenomenon Produces. allowed them to do. And yes. what it allowed them to do was yeah. to preach the gospel. Right. To share the good and, news. And it, it allows, inspires Elizabeth to make a prophetic statement mm -hmm. um, that, show, that, that shows that Mary's child is going to become the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so this is a phrase that's used of prophets in the Old Testament, like Micah. It's used of the apostles in the book of Acts who are going to preach the gospel. Yes. It's used in the book of Ephesians to talk about praising God, being filled uh, with, with the, the Spirit, Spirit and then worshiping. Right. Uh, and, and I think Elizabeth is doing both things here. She's prophesying, that is proclaiming the good news of God, but she's also praising God in, in the process. Yes. Now there's another thing uh, that's involved with this filling of the Holy Spirit, because if you'll notice, if you read the first two or three chapters of Luke, you see that prophecy is extremely prominent. Everybody mm -hmm. prophesies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even the fetus of uh, John the Baptist mm -hmm. prophesies by, by kicking by in the kicking womb. Kicking in the womb for uh, joy. Now, this, th that is a very subtle reference to something that we frequently overlook. And that is that in the Jewish mind, prophecy came to an end well before the time of the Roman invasion of Palestine and the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But there was the belief uh, which the last prophets pronounced that one day prophecy would uh, be renewed. And when, uh, in their minds, when prophecy was renewed, the age of Messiah would begin. Mm -hmm. So Luke is saying here and, re and reporting this, this prophesying by the power of the Holy Spirit over and over and over again in the birth narratives to, to make a statement. Mm -hmm. This is the Messiah and the age of Messiah is beginning with the birth of this child. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, prophesying on the day of Pentecost and the uh, sermon that Peter preaches in behalf of the 12th um, there you have this, this whole passage from Joel. Mm -hmm. The time is going to come when you're old men, old women, mm -hmm. youngsters, everybody, everybody. is going to be prophesying. Mm -hmm. And remember, that's also composed and written by Luke, mm -hmm. the book of the Acts. The book of Acts. So that, that is yeah. obviously a part yeah. Of the, of the messianic expectations. Yeah. Well, when you say everybody is prophesying in the opening chapters of Luke, I, I want to, let, let's name them. Okay. Just uh, so we have Zechariah and yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Who are both doing what we would call prophesying. That is proclaiming the work of God. And, uh, and Zechariah, people. you'll notice, he, he had his doubts. And so he was given a sign. The yeah. sign was he couldn't talk anymore. That's the next, that's our next lesson. That is a, that is a part of prophecy. A prophecy. Because prophets use signs, didn't yeah. they? Uh, so we have Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of, of John the Baptist. Mary is proclaiming the good news here in the Magnificat. And, um, and then in, we're, we're not going to have lessons on these two, but the, the very next characters that that Luke talks about in his gospel are Simeon and Anna, 
who are prophets and who do recognize Jesus as the one in whom God is going to bring about redemption. And don't forget John the Baptist. Okay, you love that <laughs> kicking in the womb. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, well, that's uh, but Elizabeth makes so much of it. She does. It's, it's, it's said twice. It's the basis on which she um, makes her proclamation. Exactly. Yeah. Now let's talk about the two blesseds that we have here in this um, section. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the blessed uh, of verse 42 emphasizes... And it's there twice. Uh, yes. And it emphasizes blessing that comes from God. Okay. Uh, so you are blessed by God. The other blessing... And the, by the way, <coughs> this word for a blessing that's uh, here said, God is doing something special in your life. You have been blessed by God right. in that sense. It's also used in giving praise and honor to God. That it's the same, the same term. Work, same term works both directions. Right, but yes. there's another word down yeah. in verse 40. Verse 45 is another word, and this is the word that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And this is a word that means more like happy or fortunate are you. So yes. it doesn't emphasize so much a, a direct blessing from God, but just the, the happiness of the state of someone who is whatever. Here, blessed is, is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. She's fortunate. She is fortunate, uh, happy. Happy. Yeah. But By that, the way, both terms... Mm -hmm. For uh, blessed uh, in the Hebrew language are used in the Psalter in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. The first Psalm begins with "Happy is the man who," mm -hmm. and then there are many places where the other term for uh, blessed blessed be God uh, who has uh, done this or that or the mm -hmm. other is the other word, and it's exactly like the two words you have described here in the Greek language. Very good. Well, let's get down to Mary's Magnificat here. Um, many uh, people have noticed that this has a lot of similarities to what we call Hannah's song in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, mm -hmm. and I have my Bible open to it, mm -hmm. let me read a, just a couple of verses out okay. of it to show the similarity. Mm -hmm. Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. That's Yahweh. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in thy sal salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. And it goes on. Yeah, yeah. Well, we see here uh, a similarity, a strong similarity, and a very significant difference. The, the, the similarity is the way in which these two songs praise God and yes. celebrate God. For instance, Mary says... What does it says, mean to magnify? It means to enlarge, it, just like our word. And it's, it is the word for enlarge. Enlarge. Yes. So my soul... Uh, God is great, and we're enlarging God. Uh, and so uh, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. That is a theme in Hannah's song. Right. But uh, our viewers listening to you may have noticed there's a strong difference as well. There's a note of revenge on one's enemies. Because there was another wife that uh, put Hannah down because uh, she has had a bunch of kids, and Hannah it doesn't have any children. Hannah was barren, yeah. But she becomes pregnant, mm -hmm. and she rejoices in her pregnancy. Yeah. Aha, I'm going to get my revenge. Right. But significantly <laughs> enough, that note of vengeance is missing from, from Mary's Magnificat. Yes. Yes. Uh, later on, in, uh, especially in verses 51 and following, we... Uh, 52 and following, we get this strong theme of reversal, which is so important in the book of Luke. It sounds very much like Psalm 113. And yes, you'd already mentioned that theme in Psalm 113, but I just wanted to point it out here in the Magnificat. Um, 
maybe verse 52 is a good place to see it. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. He filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. Yeah. That's classic um, language of reversal. And yes. Luke is fascinated with that wherever he sees it in the Old Testament and wherever he sees it in the life of Jesus. Because that's the whole theme of Passover. Oh, okay. Well, for Slaves Luke. Slaves brought uh, out and, and elevated, okay. blessed by God. Yeah. Well, for Luke, it's the theme of Jesus' ministry who yeah. reaches out to the outcasts, women, lepers, Samaritans, foreigners, <laughs> foreigners children, uh, yeah. shepherds we're going to see here in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, that's very important how he reaches out and elevates the status of these so-called outcasts. The other thing in this section of the Magnificat that I think is so interesting is the way it focuses on God. This is a celebration of God and of God's saving work. God can do this. My spirit rejoices in God. And yeah. just look at the, those pronouns. Um, verse 50, his mercy. Yeah. He has performed. He has scattered. He has brought down. He has lifted up. He filled, has filled so the hungry. hungry yeah. He has helped. This is uh, celebrating the great um, work of God. And, and two, two sides of God's work are emphasized here. One is his power, his might. Uh, there, there are actually three different words that describe the power of God just in this one short poem. It's the word greatness, the word power, and the word strength or might. But the other side of, of God's nature that's highlighted here is his mercy. Mercy, pity. Yes. Verse 50, his mercy extends to those who fear him. And then down in verse 54, remembering to be merciful. Yes. So we see the might of Yahweh and, and we the see mercy. the mercy of God, uh, both in this beautiful, beautiful song. And uh, the thing that Mary rejoices in and affirms is that God has done this for her and there's no explaining why mm -hmm. uh, because normally and under normal circumstances she would not be elevated in anybody's eyes. She's just a girl. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, lo and behold, God has, has raised her up. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that's Psalm 113. Yeah. He's well, raised the poor people up from the yeah. garbage pit. Right. <laughs> well, we could do worse this Christmas season than to put our focus not only on a baby in a manger, which, which I'm, I'm happy to think about. Oh, yes. But also to think about the greatness of our God, His might and His mercy. And coming in the form of a little baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing weaker than a little yeah, baby. That's the great reversal right there. Yeah, it? it sure is. Yeah. Well, we we're glad to, that you could be with us this morning. And we still have two lessons from the Gospel of Luke leading up to Christmas. And we're, we're enjoying this discussion so very much and hope that you are too. And we pray that you will have a good Christmas season uh, focusing on the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll see you next week. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.